and we see down at the bottom alt at all is equal to 24. That's because our class method returned an instance of our class based on the dictionary that we passed in. And this, in my opinion, is pretty neat. Welcome back to Understanding Python. My name is Jake, and today we'll dive into the basics of creating and using classes. Classes offer a way for us to make our own objects, each with the attributes and functionality we desire. Understanding and mastering classes is a fundamental skill of all great Python programmers. So let's get started. So classes are effectively object constructors, meaning that you can specify a recipe that Python then uses to build the object that you're wanting from your class. So for our very first class, we'll start very simple with a class just called basic. And in it, it's going to have a single attribute called test var, which is going to be equal to five. So let's take a look at the syntax. First, we have the initial statement called class, much like we used def for defining a function. We use the class keyword for defining a class. Right after the class keyword, we have the name basic. That is the name of our class. Then of course the line ends with a colon and underneath we have a variable called test bar being set to the value five. This is what's known as a class variable. Now how do we create an object based off this class? We do that by instantiating the class. So we'll make a new variable called basic inst or instance is equal to basic. And then we're going to put the open and close parentheses at the end of basic. This is similar to if you were calling a function and in a way you are calling a function, but we'll get more into that in a little bit. However, this is how you create an instance of your class. So basic inst becomes an instance object of basic. Let's add some print statements to take a look at these. Okay, I've added a few print statements. The first printing the basic class itself, and then we have the basic instance object, and then test var being the attribute of basic instance. And when we run this, we see that basic is a reference to the class itself. Basic instance is a reference to the basic object that's been instantiated from the class. And then basic instance dot test var is equal to five. Now earlier when I alluded to us actually calling a function on line six when we instantiated the class, what we are really calling is the dunder init method. And we can define one ourselves. And that would be def double underscore init double underscore self. And then under here we'll just put a pass statement so I can explain what's going on. So this dunder init method is what's ran when you instantiate a class. But there's something new about this. We see that in the arguments for dunder init, we have an argument there called self. And what self is, is a reference to the instance of the class each time it's initialized. And whereas test var is a class attribute, in init, we can define instance attributes, meaning variables that are specific to each individual instance. And the way we do this is just by defining more arguments, just like we have before. However, to assign them to the current instance, we're going to use that self keyword and say self dot a is equal to a. So we're actually creating a new attribute on line six of this instance called a and assigning it to the value that was passed in for argument a. In this case, the default would be one. We can do the same for b and the same for c. Now these names don't have to match if you don't want them to. For instance, if we wanted to make self.c actually be self.f, we could do that. It'll be just fine. The difference being that there would be no self.c anymore 
it would just be self.f, which would be storing the value passed in for c. To keep things simple, let's revert that back to c. Now let's change up line 11 so that we set a different value for b and c. Here we'll set b equal to 17 and c equal to a string test. And this is all perfectly valid since we're not doing any type of type checking. And we'll add a few more print statements so we can check the value of each of these new attributes. Done. So we'll save and run. And here, of course, we have our basic class exactly the same as before. Same with the instance test var, again, still equal to 5. Basic instance dot a is equal to 1. Dot b is equal to 17. And dot c is equal to test. Now, why is it important that we have these instance attributes instead of just using class attributes? Well, I loaded this file in IPython and we'll figure that out together. So in here, of course, we have our basic instance object, which has reference to test bar. If we make a new instance called basic2, and we won't pass any arguments, we now have a new object called basic2, which itself has a reference to test bar. And if we make a change to basic instance version of test bar, say make that equal to seven, we see that that change persists. And basic two's version still equals five. But what if we are to change that value on the class itself? And we'll change this to the string changed. So now we said basic.testVar is equal to changed. Well, let's take a look at our basic instance. .testVar is still equal to 7. However, basic instance 2.testVar is now equal to changed. That's because basic 2's.testVar is still referencing the original class's testVar. But since the class itself doesn't have a concept of our A, B, and C attributes, we can't modify that at the class level. If we were to try, so basic.a is equal to the string bad, we effectively just added that attribute in. But if we look at basic2.a, we still see that equals one. And if we go back to our basic instance.a, still equals to one. All of those are unaffected by the change at the class level because they are instance variables. And that's why it's good to use instance variables because it keeps things isolated. Now, aside from being able to define attributes and an init in a class, you can add in methods. So these are functions that are specific to a class. If you want to be able to access attributes of your class or other methods in your class, self needs to be the first argument of each method, as that is what Python is going to use to pass around to each of your methods. And since this is called add all, we'll simply return self.a plus self.b plus self.c. Now, what if you wrote a method that doesn't require access to the self object, like we have here with say hello. It just needs a name, which of course defaults to world and prints hello name. Well, Python allows us to do this by using a decorator called static method. That means that this method is going to be the same regardless of the implementation details of each object instance. In other words, while everything else might change, say hello is going to be exactly the same from instance to instance of this basic class. So I've added two new print statements to the bottom. The first calling add all, and notice that we didn't have to pass in any arguments to the function because self is passed in by Python, not us. And say hello can be called like a normal method in an instance, or if we add another print statement, you can call it from the class itself. 
And before we save and run this, we'll return C to a number, this time being 23, because we don't want to run into an issue when we try to add that together in at all. So we'll save it, run it. And here we see for add all, we get the value 41. And then the last couple of lines are a little awkward because it actually prints out instead of returning a value. But we see we still see hello YouTube and hello YouTube because the static method doesn't require us to instantiate an object in order to call it. Whereas if we try to call at all on basic, it wouldn't work. Now there are a couple more special types of methods that we can use with some Python. The first is called a class method. A class method is exactly what it sounds, a method that's specific to the class itself and not an instance. Now one useful pattern for class methods is defining alternate constructors. So in here, we'll make a class method called from dict. And instead of accepting self, we're going to accept class. This is going to be a reference to the class itself. And then we're also going to take in a dictionary called argdict. And in here, what we can do is actually instantiate the class because here CLS is a reference to our class. And just like the notation that we have on line 22, we can use CLS and then inside here, expand our argdict to allow us to do an alternate construction of our class. And to demonstrate this, we'll make a new instance called all instance is equal to basic dot from dict. And in here, we're going to pass in a dictionary where A maps to 7, B maps to 8, and finally C, you guessed it, maps to 9. And at the end, I've added a new print statement for alt add all, or the add all method in the alt instance. We'll save this and run it. And we see down at the bottom, alt at all is equal to 24. That's because our class method returned an instance of our class based on the dictionary that we passed in. And this, in my opinion, is pretty neat. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is if you have something that you want to do a little bit more processing on when you return a value, but you still want to access it like you would a regular attribute. Well, for this, Python provides the property decorator. And what this lets us do is say, for example, the basic instance, we can just do basic inst dot rando, and we'll get a random attribute back. We don't have to call it like we would a normal function. This is what's considered a property. So each time that you access that method like an attribute, it'll still run through all your code and return what you want. You just don't have to call it like you would a normal method. Here I added two more print statements to the bottom for the alternate instances rando. And you see how I'm just calling all inst dot rando. I'm not using any of the method notation where we have the open and close parentheses. So we'll save this and run it. And at the bottom two lines, we see alt rando gives back B and 8, and A and 7. And with that, we've wrapped up our video on the basics of classes. Now that you understand the basics of classes, try creating a few and see what you can come up with. As always, today's code will be added to the understanding GitHub repo. So check the description for a link. And of course, if you have any questions or suggestions for topics you'd like me to cover, leave a comment for me. To keep up with this series, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.